Okay. We're going to speak about the second mitzvah of the uh, Noahide mitzvahs, the Noahide law. And just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay. So the uh, second commandment of the Noahide code is not to curse God. You're muted. Okay, thanks. Okay. So if you look at it just at the surface, the law of, of not to curse God, it seems to be a very, very narrow law, uh, which, which uh, only uh, deals with about not saying God's name and, and using it as a curse, cursing God's name. Uh, but I'm going to show you that really when, when in the Noahide code, this is a code for all of humanity. So it's not, not just about not cursing God. First of all, if, if you're not cursing God, obviously you're believing in God. And not cursing God also means to, uh, to not say God's name in vain, which is in the Ten Commandments. And furthermore, it also hints to the all-encompassing and all-important law of being respectful of God of being a respectful human being, of respecting your fellow man who was created in the image of God. So really this, this one law of the Noahide code, which is do not curse God's name, do not say anything uh, uh, negative about God, is really a much more encompassing uh, law. First, let's just speak a little bit about what's the name of God. You know, God has a name. And we say you're not allowed to curse God's name. Um, it's called Birkas Hashem, and not let a curse God. Uh, we know that in the Torah, the Torah speaks about a case of where there was a person, a, a disgruntled member of the Jewish community, that cursed God, the son of Shlomit uh, Bastivri, and a, a uh, an Egyptian fellow. They had a son, and he is he is uh, he is mentioned in the Torah. And he curses God's name. And uh, as a result, the question is brought to God. And God says how you shall deal with the person that curses God. And he was, put, he was actually put to death. He was stoned to death because he cursed God's name. Interesting story. We could talk about that some other time. But it's cursing God's name. And we're going to speak about a little bit about what is God's name. This is a Kabbalah class. So we have to speak about the name of God. Uh, when we speak about the name of God generally in Hebrew, we always say Hashem. But believe it or not, Hashem is not a, the name of God. Hashem means the name. So we say Baruch Hashem. You ask someone, how are you feeling today? How are you doing? So you always thought to say Baruch Hashem. Thank, thank God. But it's not God. It's not the name of God. The name Hashem means the name. Blessed be the name of God, right? So it's it's not the uh, uh, it's not God's name itself. It's Hashem. What is the name of God? So in the Maimonides, it speaks about that there are seven names of God, but there's one name that's considered the the, the ineffable name of God, and that is more, more than likely the name that you're not allowed to curse, and that is the name of the Yud K Vav K. That's the name when you open up a Torah scroll. And you want to see the name of God. And you ask the rabbi, Rabbi, can you show me where is the name of God in the Torah? The rabbi will show you many places. It's all over. The name of God is many, many places in the Torah, the name of God. But it's written with a yud. And then a hey. And then a vav. And then a hey. And we know that's, that's a very, very mystical name. And we're not allowed to say that name in vain. We're not allowed to swear in that name. And definitely, we're not allowed to curse the name of God. That is considered a grave sin to be cursing Hashem's name. And I know they make jokes about it in, in the movies and Monty Python about cursing God. 
We have people that curse, you know, God on a regular basis. The, you know, you have people who some will say in the middle of a conversation will say, you know, uh, they'll, they'll use God's name and you know, may God curse that person, or or they might say a, a line like "God damn it." <laughs> I'm not going to say the word, but you know, that's a word that's that's used quite commonly amongst people. But the name that you need to use in the official cursing of God is the ineffable name of God, the name of God as it appears in the Torah. We as Jews never say that name. We don't pronounce the name. Even when we, uh, when we uh, read the Torah, the name of God that we, we read is the name, the, word, the name of God as we say it when we pray, which is the name of Adnai. Ado. I'm not going to say it. But the name of Adnai is Alav Dalad Nun Yud. That's the name, my my master, my lord. That's the name that's that's used when we read the Torah. And there's a tradition that although in the Torah it says Yud Kei Vav Kei, that's what's written everywhere, but we don't read it. We're not allowed to even say the word, the name of God. We say it in the form of another name of God, which is of a lesser uh, degree. And that name is the name of Adnai, my Lord, my master. And that's when we say a bracha, you say a blessing on something, you might say a bracha on lighting the candles, you say baruch ata ado. That's the bracha that we make. And that's the name that we use in, in the blessings. That's the name. When we read the Torah, we also use that name. But the ineffable name of God, the name of God that you're not allowed to even say, is the name Yudke Vavke. That's why there is a group of, uh, there's, there is a uh, religion or a cult or whatever you want to call them. They go from door to door. They're called witnesses, right? They're called Jay's witnesses. I'm not saying their name because that's the name you're not allowed to say. Many Jews don't know that, that you can't say that name. It's forbidden to say the name of that group. <laughs> so as, 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 uh, the name is J E. And an H and an O and a V and an A. That's the name of the group, right? That's the same as the Yud K Vav K, the name of God as it appears in the Torah. We're not allowed to say. What is that name? Just to give you a little idea of what that name is. It's a very, very deep, mystical, spiritual name. What, what is the origins of the name? It's, it's the transcendental name of God. It, it, the name itself expresses God's elevation that he's higher than the world he's higher than time and space and how do we see it in that name that name is a composite of the three tenses in hebrew in english we know the three tenses are the past the present and the future which represents the continuum of time god transcends time so he's higher than past present and future God is, he was, and he will be all the same. We don't have any logical understanding of that. We don't know how that works because everything we know is, is time related, right? Like what I, what I just said a second ago, it's gone. <laughs> it's in the past now. What I'm saying right now is in the present. What I haven't said yet is in the future. But to be in the past, the present, the future together is impossible for us unless you are an existence that transcends time now time and space uh, einstein taught us are, are all tied in one with the other if you can break the barrier of space you probably can break also the barrier of time so like space is very very vast but the faster you could travel in that space the smaller the space becomes, right? So space can shrink if you can manage, if you manage to travel to that space in a faster time. So time and space are, are sort of tied in one with the other. So if it takes me years ago, it would take me, uh, you know, 10 hours to travel to New York by car. New York is very far. If I could travel to New York by plane, then that space becomes a little smaller because now I can get there in an hour and a half. 
besides all the time before and after the, the, the flight, we're not talking about that. <laughs> right, that. That makes it about the same. But generally speaking, you can fly in an hour and a half. So now New York is much closer. The space has shrunk. Now, can you imagine if I get on a supersonic jet and I get to New York in five minutes? New York is like going to shul. Now, if I find a faster plane that they can get there in like in 10 seconds, right, as long as it takes me to reach out my hand to touch to touch you on, on the on the on the zoom, then that space has not shrunk. It's it's like right here, right? So uh, space is tied in with time. And if I could be in New York right now without any time at all, if there's a way for me to be here and in New York at the same time, so then there's no space really. I've, I have broken the barrier of space by shrinking the time. Same way as the other way too. It's like if, if uh, you know... Time also is a relative thing. It's called a theory of relativity, right? Time is also a relative thing. You know? Time is, is, is uh, you know, takes a certain amount of time for this class to take, right? So when you were a young kid and you were in school and you used to look at the time on the wall while your teacher was giving his class or her class, remember how the, the clock barely moved. It just wouldn't move, it stopped, it froze. It was a boring class, and, and the clock was like, it wasn't moving. Like, you looked at it, you could, you could promise that, 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 not in the name of God, you, you could promise that, that the clock is, has been in the same place for the last week. <laughs> it doesn't move, right? It's like so, and when you come to Rabbi Plotkin's class, it takes a second, right? They're like, boom, the class is over in a, in a split second. You don't even know it started, right? Why? Part of it is when you get older, time starts to go a little faster. You know? It's like the astronaut that went to outer space, the religious astronaut, he came back from outer space and he came down and, and they asked him, knew how was it? He says, I am so tired. He says, why? Why are you so tired? He says, I'm religious astronauts. I had to dive in the morning prayer, the afternoon prayer, the evening prayer, Shachas Milchem I, this thing was moving around the earth so fast that I was going, shachas mechamayr, shachas mechamayr, shachas mechamayr. I'm so tired from davening so many times in split seconds. That's if you're able to, to transcend the, uh, I'm giving a little idea of to transcending the limitations of time and space. So uh, God is, is the ultimate of Maybe because God is so old that already everything is like, you know, goes so quickly. It's like time starts to go quickly when you get older. So if, you, if you're, you're like billions of years old, so like, hey, everything God goes, every year goes so fast. But we know that Hashem is beyond time and space and that he's in a space where there is no time and there is no space. So, like you say, we can understand that a little bit, but we can't really grasp it in our heads. So the name Yudke Vavke, what is the ineffable name of God? What is that name? Yud, Hev, and Avav, and He is the three tenses in Hebrew. The word for something which was is Haya. The word for something which is, is Hove. And the word for something that will be is Yihye. So Haya, Hove, Yihye. If you were to make one word out of all three to describe God's transcendental nature, like we say in Adon Alam, Haya Hove Vihiye, He was, He is, and He will be. What what word would you would you would you make to combine all three tenses? The answer is that's the name Yud K Vav K Yud He Vav and He has all three tenses in that one four letter word. So a genius thing to make it a composite. So th this is, a, it's, it's a name that says he was, he is, and he will be. He's higher than time and space, beyond us. Anyways, that's the name Yudke Vavke, but, but we generally don't use that name. We use the other names. 
But the halacha is, in order to curse God, you have to use that name. So that's sort of a caveat. So it's a safety clause. Most people don't even know that name, so they're not cursing the, the real name of God. But in, in, in Jewish law, we know there's another law which says to not, to not swear in the name of God in vain. Do not use God, God's name in vain. That Jews have in the Ten Commandments. And that would be swearing in God's name in vain would, would be, let's say, if you swear falsely, that's using God's name in vain. Or if you swear for something that everybody knows that exists, or if you swear to break a mitzvah of the Torah, and then there's a four, there are four possibilities of how you could use God's name in vain in the context of a, a, a promise. But here we come to the big thing. The big thing that really, to me, this second law of the Noahide Code is not only about swearing, not only about cursing God, or about swearing in God's name, using God's name in vain. But most important, it's respecting God. And we as Jews have many laws, subcategories of this, to reinforce the concept of respecting God. We know that we need to respect our synagogues. Right? You're not allowed to go to sleep in a synagogue. You're not supposed to eat in a synagogue. You're not supposed to speak during services, secular things and nonsensical things. Most people know that law. A lot of people don't know that law, but you know, when you when you walk into a synagogue, you have to show respect for Hashem. When someone goes up to the Torah to the bima, when they go down, they they walk backwards, like the Kohen Gadol when he went into the temple, he would walk out backwards to show respect for the place of God, God's place of worship. So there are many, many ways of, 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 of showing uh, this, this respect. And one of them is also respecting a fellow human being. Because if people are created in the image of God, so we need to respect that which was made in God's image. It has God's image. So part of respecting God, a subsidiary of that, is respecting a fellow human being. One of the greatest principles of the Torah, which was told to Adam, is that I have made you in my image. In the book of Genesis, it says, let us make man in our image. And as a result of that, you can't murder, you can't do that, but it's one of the important things is the respect we have for each other. So when you see another person, you see a piece of God, a reflection of God, the image of God. Right? So you have to show that great respect. One of the areas that really is expressed is in honoring our parents, right? So a subsidiary of this law, not to curse, is respecting God. And a subsidiary of that is honoring fellow human being and honoring your parents. Why is honoring your parents so important? Because honoring your parents is your parents created you in some degree. It says there are three partners in every child. It's Hashem and your father and the mother. So the parents give the child a physical body and God infuses the child with the breath of life. So there are three. Uh, three. So the genetic material comes from the parents and, and the godly material comes from God. So here we go. We have to respect our parents because they are godlike. Part of honoring God is honoring that which brought you into being. So you need to also honor your parents who also brought you to some degree into being. And it's an area that many people unfortunately neglect. And we know how important it is to honor our parents, both when they are alive and when they pass away. And we said Shiva. We said Shiva, we do lots of things uh, to honor our parents posthumously as well. Um, we even say Kaddish for a parent who was not so good. And the, uh, the question is why? 
Why should we sit shiva? Why is it again? Because part of the parent is not just the parent. It's the honor that we're bestowing on God, the parent of all parents. So someone asked the question, what about if a parent is abusive? Obviously, if a parent is abusive. I mean, first thing is to, while, while the parent is alive, to, you know, not to, not to hang out with that parent for sure. Uh, you know, stay far away from that parent. Um, report them to the authorities because they could be a danger to many people. Right? Uh, but at the same time, there still is a mitzvah, believe it or not, to honor that parent. A lot of times people come to me when a parent, a parent like that passes away. We have to show respect. I say, yeah, that's the Jewish way. That we show respect to a parent, even if they're not, even if they're imperfect. You know, there are stories in the Talmud, the one rabbi, his mother spat him in the face, and he still act respectfully. By the way, respect doesn't mean love. Yeah, respect doesn't mean you know love. No one can command you. It doesn't say anywhere you shall love your parents. It says you shall respect your parents. Because mm -hmm. part of the respect for a parent is really the respect for that which brought you into this world, and recognizing that it all goes back, back, back till it goes back to God. There was once a rabbi that was on the plane, and he was sitting next to a professor. In a big university, and the rabbi and the professor had a good conversation. And uh, the professor, after he finished speaking to the rabbi, he says, Wow, I'm so impressed, not so much by you, but by your son who's sitting next to you. The rabbi, the elderly rabbi, had his son sitting next to him. And he was watching the professor the whole time of how the son was serving the father and bringing him his slippers and and you know, just just taking care of him and every everything that he needed. And he says, "You're so lucky." He says, "You know, my kids they don't give me this kind of respect." So where does this come from? How do you? He says, "Well, it's the Torah. Torah teaches us about honor, respect. And that's what I train my child with." Said, but why? Yeah, well, give me something deeper, Rabbi. Why is your child like so? My kids also they also had they also were brought up in a respectful home. So he said to the professor, well, with all due respect to the professor, you know, it's a difference. You know, we are taught that humanity comes from, from God. We are the creation of God. You teach your children that, that humanity comes from the apes, <laughs> monkeys, right? So every generation earlier is one generation closer to the apes, right? So if you go back a generation, it's one generation... And you keep going back, it's even more. So why, why should he respect the generations that are closer to the apes? Every generation forward is more progressive. In our tradition, he says, it's quite the opposite. A parent is greater than us. A grandparent is greater than them. And because we, everything goes back, all the way back to God. So uh, a previous generation is a generation closer to God and worthy of a greater level of respect. Yeah, not all parents are perfect. We know that. We know that not every parent is, you know, some, some of them are a piece of work, you know. But as a, we have a religious duty, you know, and I, I deal with a lot of people over, over the years who just for some reason they won't respect their parents. Even, even sometimes religious people, they won't respect the parents. And because they had the issues with the kids and all that. So the first thing I tell them is you don't have to live with them in the same place. You don't have to live with them in the same city. But, you know, respect them. Send them a card once in a while. Show some kind of honor. Not because they're worthy of it, but because they're just in the seat, you know. When you're in the seat that's worthy to be honored, then you're, you're, you're you know, it's like when the Jews used to go to the king. Not every king was so good, but they bowed down to the king because the king represented the leadership. So maybe this king failed to be a leadership. You go to the to the president, the prime minister, I mean, even though there's free speech today and everything, you still have to show respect to a leader and a king. There's a special bracha that's made for the king. Why? Because the king 
Hashem is the king of kings. And so the king, the leader, leadership is, is closer to God in a way. And uh, so, yes, we're allowed to criticize. We're allowed to, you know, we, don't, we shouldn't take, you know, uh, abuse of kings, of leaders. We, we have to speak up. But there is a degree of respect. That's just the way it goes. Why? Because we have to respect God. And it's interesting that the Ten Commandments, you have two tablets. First set of the, the first side of the tablets is mitzvahs between man and God. The second tablet is between man and, and man, between human beings. You know, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false testimony, thou shalt not covet. That's in the, in the second tablet. Those are commandments. The first tablet is all about commandments with God. First one is, thou shalt, thou, thou shalt believe in God. Second one is, thou shalt not have any other gods, a, a prohibition against idolatry. And then we have the, 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 the respect of God, you know, not say God's name in vain. And then we have to keep the Sabbath holy. But then we have an interesting thing, the fifth commandment on, 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 the, on the, the tablet, which is between man and God, is honor your father and mother. Commentaries will ask, why, why is that on the first tablet to be in the second one? That's really between man and man. Oh. And you see this. It's, it's not an interpersonal uh, respect. It belongs in the section about respecting God. There is, it belongs in the section of mitzvah between man and God. Is the mitzvah to honor your parents. So honoring your parents is about honoring God. And that's why it's on the first tablet. There's a great story of Viktor Frankl. He was a big professor in Vienna. Because he was a big professor when the, when the, when the Nazis were coming into power, he got a visa to go to, to, to England and to leave the, 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 the Holocaust. It was right, right, it was right after uh, Kristallnacht. A day later, he got this. But he had a quandary. He didn't know how to... How to um, leave his parents you know he, he has, should he leave his parents or not I mean, it's, he's, a, he's a faithful son so he went he decided he'll go to his father's house and we'll speak it over with him what he should do but before he had a chance his father said you know we just had crystal nacht here i was out on on the on the the street and i and i found a little uh a little i have a little souvenir from the crystal nacht the son uh, victor asked his father what what was it he showed him a a, a piece of the Ten Commandments on one of the shuls on the street where they threw some rocks and they broke, you know, they had a big, uh, uh, in front of the shul, they had a, like a, a beautiful uh, statue, Moses, the Ten Commandments. Right? And they broke into pieces. As we know what they did on Kristallnacht. So it's called Crystal Kristallnacht. They broke everything, pieces. And the father said, look, I have a little piece of the Ten Commandments. And he says, uh, he said, can I see it? So he says, yeah, here. He gave it to the Victor. Victor gives a look at it. And he, he freezes in his tracks. What do you see on that thing? He got, the father brought the peace. Thou shalt honor your father and mother. He says, he says God was speaking to me. So I wasn't a religious man, but uh, I couldn't, you know, break away from that, like destiny that was being, you know, serendipity, whatever you want to call it. It was like just uh, something that happened at that moment. God was telling me, I have to stay with my father. And so he stayed with his father. And we know the, the story. He was, taken, he was taken to the concentration camps. He survived the war. But it's interesting that the whole Logan therapy that he created after, after the war is all his whole book, Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl is all based on his experiences in the concentration camps. It means his his gift to humanity, his mission of life, was granted by him being in the in the concentration camps. That he was able to to create, and he he observed that people that had a search of meaning, people that had a meaning to life, a purpose in life, were able to survive much better than those that had no purpose in the concentration camps. And so. The, that became the, the, the core of, of his philosophy, of his psychology, 
was the most powerful drive in the human being is their search for meaning and purpose. And he, he created that because he was in the con. If he would have gone to England, I mean, he would have had an easier life. But they would not have been the teachings of Viktor Frankl today for all, us, for all of us to help people in the cancer wards today deal with their suffering that they go through. And many of them read this book and this gives them great strength to be able to, 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 to overcome their challenges. All because the commandment, honor your father and mother. Right? Because you found that little piece of, uh, you know, that little broken piece that the father showed him that he picked up from the crystal nacht. Which commandment? Honor thy father and mother. Which, we, as we say, is a piece in the first tablet, which is the commandment between man and God. That's part of honor. That is the second commandment of the Noahide code, which is a code for all of humanity. The first commandment which we discussed last week was um, a prohibition against cruelty to animals, to be sensitive to, to, to all the living creatures of God. That was the first commandment. The second commandment today we speak about is being respectful. Respectful of God and respectful of that which reflects God in this world. And so we're talking about the code for all of humanity, spiritual code for all of humanity, which was given by God in, in, the, in the Kabbalah of creation. At the very beginning of time, he gave humanity, he gave Adam and Noah these seven laws, which now we're beginning to see a little bit how this could be a code for all of humanity. First, mitzvah sensitivity to God's creation. Second commandment, honoring God, respecting Hashem. That uh, is today. And next week, we move on to a few more laws of the Noahide Code and, and its, its Kabbalistic ramifications. Anyone have any questions? Some good questions. Uh, Rabbi, may I just comment? Um, as you know, all of you know, there is a Holocaust Education Week. And we attended at the Leah Poslum Theater um, the session for children of Holocaust survivors. And initially there was a presentation of three speakers and then they divided us into smaller groups. And it was totally surprising this year because in my little group, there were uh, two or three people saying how much, I'm sorry to say that, hated their mother growing up and they had a feeling that the mother hated them. And the young social worker, that was supposed to help us to deal with these issues, she didn't know what to do with that. They need you, Rabbi. Shocked. She was shocked. She was shocked. She was shocked. But I was totally surprised because one lady said that her mother um, had, uh, she had terrible time in concentration camp and she understood that. But she couldn't understand as a small child how mean and how difficult her life was because of mother's experience. And now her mother is in a retirement um, place at Kensington. And she said, I am the one that goes there every day and take care of her. I forgave her. And suddenly when she said the word forgave her, it was like a different person. Like it was like if uh, the pickle that she was carrying on her back just disappeared. A release. A release. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Forgiveness is very important, especially for people who, who live through so much. And, you know, we, we, can't, we can't start to understand what they live through. Can you hear me? No, we couldn't hear you. Huh? Now we, we can couldn't hear you. Now you can hear me? Now I'm just saying for, forgiveness is 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 of highest order, and especially for people who live through the Holocaust. And uh, you know the, you know Hitler, uh, you know turned a lot of people into into uh, very very, uh, you know challenging people, and uh, you know this is it's, for these these people you have to have rachmanis for you know the, 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 what they what they live through. And uh, unfortunately, like many times, they let it out on their children. And that's why I'm saying that, uh, that you 
know, sometimes we have to be forgiving. We have to forgive, we learn how to forgive, and definitely to show respect. So, like for this this girl, you know, for a parent, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to 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 like you say to forgive, but to respect and honor is is something that 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 you know most of us can do. If, you know, you need to really it takes a long time. You know, it's, it's a lot of service. But, but honor, 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 we can show. Honor, we can show. Respect, we can show. Thank you, Rabbi. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. 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 Thank you.